Hey, I was in the, the kids' life today on fifth Sundays. I go and do a lesson first and then come out here. And uh, our lesson today was on uh, Halloween masks, pretending to be someone you're not. And, and, and we talked about, you know, some people pretend to be the devil. We talked about that. Some people pretend to be really wise and know more than God. We talked about that. Some people pretend to be angels. We talked about that. They think they're really too, they're good enough. Uh, some people uh, talk, uh, they pretend to be mummies, uh, that they're alive when they're really dead. Uh, uh, some people try to be invisible, they're a ghost. And I told them, no scary masks. And then I said, well, I broke the rule. I said, uh, some people try to be, oh, try to be me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just try to be me. You know what? God wants me to be me, and he doesn't want you to be me. He wants you to be you and me to be me. You know? Happy Halloween. Has anybody celebrated Halloween? Is anybody going to celebrate it? Anybody besides me dressed up for Halloween? All right, cool, cool. I, um, last uh, Sunday evening, we had our harvest happening. And I came in my leisure suit, I talked about. And if uh, you weren't here early to see the slides, then you probably missed me in my leisure suit. So that'll, that'll learn you to get here late. Now, here's another thing. Next week, all right, time changes. So you fall back. If you don't fall back, let's see, that means you get here really early, like an hour early. You'll get, then there'll be more than just me here at church. That'll be great. So don't forget to set your clocks back, all right? So happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. So I want to talk today, we're in a series in First John, what you really need to know. And what you really need to know today, we're going to talk about what you really know, need to know about Antichrist. And in this study, the question we've got to ask ourselves is, who is Antichrist? Who is Antichrist? Well, the word antichrist comes from two words in the Greek language. Anti, which is a preposition, it means instead of or against. And then Christos, which is Christ. It is a person who is instead of, a substitute, they claim to be Christ, or they are totally against Christ, because you're totally against Christ if you're claiming to be Christ. And so there is this individual antichrist. Now, down through history, there have been a lot of people identified as antichrist. So my question today is, Will the real Antichrist please stand up? I don't see anybody standing up here. Okay. Well, down through history, there's been a few who have, who have uh, been labeled Antichrist. One was Caligula because he uh, indirectly started persecuting Christians, and he was the first one. The real one that was thought in the early church was Nero. Remember Nero? He was burning Christians at the stake, and he was trying to put out the sect of Christianity. He burned Rome and blamed it on, uh, on the Christians. And so the early people in the Christian faith identified him as Antichrist. As time went on, it became the Pope. When the Pope declared that he was a vicar of Christ, a substitute Jesus, the Protestant Reformation heroes of the faith all identified him as Antichrist because he was not truly Christ. All right? And then during World War II, Mussolini, because he rose to power in Italy and was trying to dominate the world as uh, being a Roman emperor of some sort, and so he became identified as Antichrist. And then Henry Kissinger. Some of you remember Henry Kissinger. He lived in your lifetime. Uh, he was identified because he was negotiating peace in the Middle East, and he was of a Jewish background. And so they thought he was the Antichrist, bringing about the peace treaty mentioned in Daniel chapter 9, that he is the Antichrist. Now, some people felt Obama was Antichrist. Some people think Trump is Antichrist. They just don't like the guy. There's nothing he's doing. Some people believe Biden is Antichrist because he's got so many policies that are anti-Christian. I'm here to tell you, none of these people are Antichrist. They're not at the Antichrist. So we're going to talk about who the real Antichrist is. He is a future end time villain. He is a villain. It says in 1 John 2.18, we've already covered this verse once in our study through John. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard 
that the Antichrist is coming. He's a future end-time character that's going to appear on the scene, and he has not yet appeared. And we're going to see why he has not yet appeared as we go down through the book of 1 John. Let me remind you that 1 John is the only place, uh, I should say in the epistles of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, are the only places the word Antichrist is mentioned in the whole Bible. That doesn't mean the Antichrist is not referred to in other places in the Bible. It just means that term is only used of this end-time evil villain in the books of, of John. They are not found in the Revelation and Daniel, other places. He's described by other names. Even Paul uses other names for him. John wants us to know about the person of the Antichrist, and he also wants us to know about the people of the Antichrist. Dear children, this is the last hour. Well, he said that in the other verse, in the previous verse about Antichrist. This is the last hour. Now, if I could just remind you when we were in chapter 2, uh, that the last hour is not 60 minutes. I know there's a program on television, 60 minutes. It's not just a 60-minute window span. It's used for a period of time. Uh, Jesus told his, his mother, my hour is not yet come, when she wanted him to change the water to wine at, at the wedding feast, his first miracle. And he said, my hour is not yet come. What do you mean his hour? 60 minutes? No. Several times through the gospel, he says, my hour is not yet come. And then, then when it was this week of passion, he said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And so he went to the cross, he died, he was buried, he rose again, and he ascended into heaven. And we know that that was the passion hour. It lasted more than 60 minutes. The hour he's talking of here, he, dear children, this is the last hour. Since Jesus has ascended into heaven until he comes again, we are in the hour of Antichrist. There are false Christs who come up denying who Jesus is and claiming to be Jesus Christ. And you've heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come. You know, there's probably a, an element of truth in all those characters that I put up on the screen as being Antichrist. They all probably had something in their lives that was against Jesus Christ. In that sense, they're Antichrist, against him. Are they the end-time villain? No, they're not the end-time villain. As bad as some of them may be, Mussolini, Nero, as bad as they may have been, they are nothing compared to the end time villain. Nothing compared to him. But he's saying here, even now many antichrists have come, and this is how we know that it is the last hour. There are many of them here now. We know that there are those who oppose Jesus Christ. So he turns at this point and says, there is not only the person of the antichrist, the people of the antichrist, there is the spirit of the antichrist. He says, test the spirits. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Test the spirits to see if they are from God. Why would I do that? Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And Jesus said, they are wolves in sheep's clothing. They, they are deceivers. They... They pretend to be good, but they are evil. Kind of like the masks that we were wearing. They pretend to be good, but are evil. Even Satan, when he went to Eve in the garden, pretended to be good and tried to attribute the evil to, G to, to God. Has God really said, you can't eat? God just knows the day that you eat, you'll be like him. He's holding back from you. He was a liar and a cheat and a false speaker, a false prophet. There are a lot of people who claim to be ministers of Jesus Christ, and they are not. They preach a false gospel. They deny that Jesus is the Christ, and they just would say he's a great teacher with great moral values, that we need to follow those, and we will have a better life. That is so far from what it was all about. Yes, we should do all those things, but that's what not the gospel is. The gospel is that Jesus came into the world. He died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again. And if we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we will be saved from our sins. 
You've got to test the Antichrist's message to see is it truly of God. So how do I do that? How do I test the message? This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. You want to know what the truth is, and that way you'll know what the error is. I have a fake $100 bill that I'm waiting to give to the grandkids. This should be fun. It looks just like one. I was deceived. I was tricked. But then I noticed in a real fine print on it, it said, not real money. I, when I first saw it, I, I, I said, whoa, look, that's a $100 bill. A and it's fake. How do I know it was, was, was fake? Well, besides saying so, when I felt the paper, uh, it wasn't the same. And when I... Because I knew what a real dollar bill feels like. Uh, not, a, not a real $100 bill. It's, a, it's not like you're carrying those in your pocket all the time. But, but uh, I knew what a real, real money felt like. So I, I was able to realize what was fake. And when you really know Jesus as your Savior, you know what is fake. You know the fraud. You know the deception. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, entered the world and was born of the Virgin Mary and, and that he lived a life to go to the cross and die for our sins. That message, when the people really believe that message, that comes from God. They're genuine Christians. But if they do not believe that message... They believe that Jesus was the devil's brother, like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. They have a false Jesus message that he is less than the Son of God, God come in the flesh. That is the spirit not of God, but he's going to say it's the spirit of Antichrist. You see, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is, is not from God. When you reject that Jesus is from God, the Son of God, who came into the world to save sinners, then you are not of the Spirit of God, but you are the Spirit of the Antichrist. Spirit of Antichrist. So we, we test the message. We test the message and the messenger. We also test the Spirit itself. This is the Spirit of Antichrist who denies who Jesus is, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. Listen, I get the symbol of a dove for the Holy Spirit. Because when the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus, he descended like a dove. But we got this scavenger bird that is after the souls of men, and he is of the spirit of Antichrist, who is not, not here to fill you, but to destroy you. Test the spirit. What spirit is this message coming from, from the messenger? He says, the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard, is coming. The Antichrist is yet in the future. He's coming, but his spirit, the, the Antichrist atmosphere and spirit is already here. It's already here. Already attacking Christian values, undermining the scripture. Personally, I don't think it'll be long until they're going to say my Bible is hate speech and say that I cannot preach from God's word, at which time I will have to be civilly disobedient and say I must obey God rather than men. No matter what the cost. No matter what the cost. What you heard is coming and even now is already. It's present. It's present. It's present. I want to talk about the defeat of Antichrist. Because he is not going to win in the end. We're going to see that here shortly. It says, you dear, dear children are from God and have overcome them. What? The spirit of Antichrist, the message of Antichrist, the messenger of Antichrist. You've overcome all of that. Why? Because you believe the truth. You believe in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is your Savior from your sins. And he's going to tell us, because the one who is in you 
is greater than the one who is in the world. Amen? You sang that this morning, didn't you? The song, Greater. Greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. Who is he talking about? He's talking about the Holy Spirit. The moment you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are invaded. The Holy Spirit takes up residency within you. Your body becomes His temple. He tells us that twice. Once in 1 Corinthians 3.16, then again in chapter 6. He tells us twice that the whole, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He dwells in you. He seals you so that he, you are an authentic Christian. So when the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth, He looks down and He sees that you have the Holy Spirit of God residing within you, God says, that one is mine. You belong to Jesus. You are His. You are His. I love this verse because it says, Greater is He that is in me than he who is in the world. God is in me. And if He is greater than He is in the world, I can never ever be demon-possessed I can never, ever be filled with the spirit of Antichrist. There is no room for him when the Holy Spirit dwells in his holy temple. I may be influenced from the outside, but I never have demon possession from the inside. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I am secure in Jesus. This is a defeat of him. They they, they are are from the world. And therefore, they speak from the world. The viewpoint of the world. And the world listens to them. A couple of Sundays ago, we talked about there's the world kind of love. If you were of the world and you love like the world, the world would love you like the world loves you. But you are not of the world, so the world doesn't love you. It hates you. And now he's saying that your viewpoint, your perspective, the way you look at things is different from the world. The world certainly has its perspective, doesn't it? You can turn on any of the news stations and every single one of them's got their spin. They spin the facts. They just spin those facts. I don't care which station you turn to, they spin the facts. Remember the program, I think it was Dragnet, Just the Facts. Oh, for those days. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Just give me the facts. And I'll let the Holy Spirit be my guide so that I can discern through the facts what the truth is. Listen. The world viewpoint is not the biblical viewpoint. The devil is using the world's viewpoint to persuade the world to be anti-Christ And they all pat each other on the back with their anti-Christian views that are spread throughout the world. It should not surprise us that there's so much evil in the world and that they call evil good and good evil. We're living in times when teachers dissenting at a public school board hearing are made criminals and the real criminals don't have to have bail to get out and go do their crime all over again. This is, Bible says, end times. Calling evil good and good evil. We are living in a real messed up world. And, and, but from their viewpoint, it all makes sense. And we're saying, what in the world is going on here? Because we don't share their viewpoint. My worldview is a Christian biblical worldview. And so everything I do, everything I say, everything I think, everything I watch, I interpret it through the Scriptures. And I interpret through a Christology that says Jesus Christ is Lord. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. Do you notice that? They listen to us. Now, this listen means more than just you hear his voice, because I'm not hearing the voice of John. John recorded it, and, and when I read it out loud, I hear it in my voice, But the idea of listen here is they hearken unto. You listen as in, hey, listen to me. Take out the trash. What am I saying? Obey me. It's not just, okay, you heard my words. Did you hear them? Oh, yeah. Well, how come you're not doing it? I said, listen to me. We mean obey me. Obey me. We are from God, and whoever knows God 
obeys us. What is he talking about? I have written this letter to you. It's recorded here in the Word of God. Those who are from God, they listen, they obey the Word of God. And whoever is not from God does not listen to God. They don't obey the Word. The Word is an obstacle. We've got to figure out a way to get around it. Uh, we want to take those verses that talk about the sanctity of life and somehow get around it so it doesn't apply to the unborn. Uh, we got to... We would take those verses that talk about gender identity, get around that and say, hey, you can pick your own gender instead of God. I take those verses in the Bible that talk about being made in the image of God and you just, I'll just move those things around. I'll get around all that. But whoever is not from God does not obey us, the Word of God. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. What are you obeying? What are you listening to? The Word of God or the Word of man? Where is your allegiance? Dear friends, let us love one another. You know how he ties that together? Once you, 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 if you love the Word, you're going to love one another, for love comes from God. You're going to hear about it in the Word, and it's going to change your heart, and then it's going to express itself in real life. For everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Now check this out. The word uh, born of God is in the perfect tense. It means something like this. Everyone who loves has previously been born of God. You've been born again. And you know God. You stand in a relationship of knowing God. And that's why you love. It didn't come from you. We love him because he first loved us. You have to have Jesus Christ in your life. He has to be your Savior and Lord. For you to produce the agape kind of love that the scriptures is talking about, where you are self-sacrificing for brothers and sisters in Christ, and you are meeting their need. Now we turn to Second John. We're going to cover all these uh, references to Antichrist. In Second John one seven, it says, "Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh." have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the Antichrist. The hallmark of the Antichrist is deception. He wants to deceive you to not believe in Jesus Christ. The end-time villain is going to claim that he himself is God. So how can you have your allegiance to Jesus and allegiance to him so he is out to deceive so that you will believe that he is God. Let's talk about the end time villain for a moment. He's not always called Antichrist. There are so many names. I'm just going to pick a handful of these that are used in the scriptures. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 36, he is called, I call him the willful king. He is the king who does as he pleases. He does his own will. He, he does not follow God at all. He will exalt himself and magnify himself, himself high above every God and will say unheard things against the God of gods. He blasphemes God, himself claiming to be God. We find this from time to time even to this day. Well, if God were a, a good and loving God, he wouldn't allow anybody to be sick or, or to die or go to hell. What kind of God would do that? Like, your God is going to pass judgment upon my God, who is absolutely holy and righteous and good and does those things to exalt his holiness. And at the same time, he loves so much that he made a provision so you, don't, you can escape hell, damnation, destruction, you, you, you can have forgiveness of your sins. This guy is going to say all kinds of blasphemous things against the God of gods, and he will, he will be successful until the time of wrath is completed and the day of his judgment comes for what has been determined must take place. God is running his universe, and even in the most bleakest, darkest hour, he is still in control. He is still in control. He's taking everything to its intended purpose. Another term for use, use for him is found in Zechariah. He's called the worthless shepherd. You see, he, he is uh, 
Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Psalm 23 said, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, Peter calls him the chief shepherd. It does not surprise me that the Bible is going to call him the worthless shepherd. He says, for I'm going to raise up a shepherd over the land who will not care for the, the lost or seek the young or heal the injured or feed, uh, feed the healthy. But he will eat the meat of one choice sheep, tearing off their hoofs. Listen, instead of protecting the sheep, they're his meal. He's feasting on them. He, he's destroying them. Woe to the worthless shepherd who deserts the flock. May the sword strike his arm in his right eye. May his name or his arm uh, be completely withered, his right eye totally blinded. God says, I'm going to judge this guy. He's going to be def defeated. Jesus calls him the hired hand, the hired shepherd. And the hired hand, he says, because he said, I am the good shepherd. But the hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. He doesn't own them. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and he runs away. He's not there to protect. Then the wolf attacks the flock and it scattered the man who runs away because he is a hired hand and does not care. He cares nothing for the sheep. Antichrist just says he does. He's a liar. He's a liar. He's a lawless one in 2 Thessalonians that says this, Do not let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. He's called the man of lawlessness. I got the Constitution up there. That's our law. But he totally disregards the law. I think God's law it's kind of like disregarding our Constitution today. Is that happening? Oh, yeah. Are people accepting that? Yeah, we are. Wait till he really starts abandoning this end time care. He's going to get, abandon God's law, and, and he's going to be revealed. He's called the man of doom, he's doomed to destruction. Similar words used for Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot. This lawless one, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. So that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. That's why they call him Antichrist. Instead of the true Christ, he sets himself up to be worshipped as God. In fact, it goes on to say, a couple verses later, and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow. Amen. I love this part. With the breath of his mouth, and he will destroy by the splendor of his coming. Jesus is going to return and destroy this end time character called the Antichrist. That's why I say, we win, he loses. He is called the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. People are going to believe. Why? Because they did not test the spirit of what he is proclaiming. He's producing counterfeit miracles just like Janus and Jamboree's did in the time of Moses and Aaron. When Moses threw down his rod and it became a snake, their magicians threw down their rods and they became a snake, except Aaron said, gobble theirs up. There are false miracles. He's going to be a wonder working, displaying false miracles, and the people who always just believe in the signs and not testing the Spirit are going to be duped by his fake, fraudulent miracle signs and wonders. You always, always, always have to test what is being done by the scriptures. I grew up in the Berean Baptist Church of Detroit. And the word Berean is found in Acts chapter 17. And my Sunday school teacher, when I was uh, probably in about the fourth or fifth grade, he was a proofreader for the Detroit Free Press. And he could read the Bible faster than I could turn the pages. 
And he would say, oh, I know it's in, and he said, wait a minute. And he'd be flipping those pages, and boom, right there it was. And he was reading them. I, I just couldn't believe this, man. This guy was anywhere in the Bible. He, he could just read like crazy. But he taught me what it meant to be a Berean. Those at Berea were more noble than those who were at Thessalonica. Here's why. They searched the scriptures daily to see whether or not the things the Apostle Paul was saying were true. Wow. You want to be noble in God's sight? You get in the book and you check it out and you see if what Pastor Dennis is actually preaching is true. You get in the book and you check out what the TV evangelists are saying. Is that really true? Is that really true? We test the miracles, the signs, the wonders that are counterfeit, the message that is counterfeit. We test it by the Spirit of Christ. And the whole idea, are they proclaiming that Jesus Christ came into the world, died for our sins, He was buried, He rose from the dead, He ascended into heaven, and He's coming back for us. And He is King, not somebody else. The lawless one is going to exalt himself with lying wonders and in every sort of evil. You see, they're going to say evil is good and good is evil, and they're going to try to convince people to do what is wrong in the name of doing what is right. Well, every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. <sighs> they're perishing. They're already perishing, but he's deceiving them so they'll stay in the condition of their lostness, their fallenness, and they perish. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. They're going to say, you know what? Your gospel is so old-fashioned. That is not it. We've got a new age version of how, how, how to be delivered. Uh, your, your Bible is just full of myths, and we, we, are, we believe in science. When people tell me they believe in science, I say, which science do you believe in? The medieval science that believed the earth was flat? <laughs> well, that science changed, didn't it? Uh, do you believe in the science that... Uh, and you just go, science is always changing, always changing. So what they're actually saying is, I don't know what I believe. The scientists today will be refuted tomorrow. And so my, my faith is constantly changing. I don't know what I believe. But God's word is forever settled in heaven. Listen, they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so to be saved. You've got to know the truth in order to be saved. And Jesus said, I am the truth. You've got to know Jesus in order to be saved. Looking at the end time Antichrist villain, you can go to Revelation chapter 13. And this is a whole chapter is devoted to Antichrist. He doesn't go by that name. He goes by the name of a beast. There are two beasts mentioned. They're both, I believe, Antichrist. One of them is the end-time villain Antichrist. Theologians are, decided, are divided over which one is which. The majority believe the first one is. I don't. I believe the second one is. The first one, as we see, I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. The sea is the sea of humanity. It's the Gentile powers. He's got ten heads, he's got these crowns, and one of his heads is wounded, and he revives from that wound. It's a, a fatal wound, so he, he, he somehow replicates the resurrection, and he presents himself to be, be God. And he's asking everybody to worship him. He's got military power and might. He's the guy, I believe, that is mentioned in, in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, called the Roman ruler. He's from the West. He is the leader of the, the Western world. But I go down a little bit further in the passage and I saw another beast coming up out of the earth or the land, and the land is the land of Israel. I believe this guy is going to be like the willful king mentioned in Daniel chapter 11, and that this end-time guy is going to exalt himself as God, and he's going to worship the military power of the west of the other beast. So much so that he's going to set up a statue of him in the temple, and he's going to maintain He's going to make it somehow mysteriously come to life, the statue. Woo. This guy is going to uh, 
He's going to be powerful because the text says he has all the authority and power of the first beast. And yet he does something the first beast does not do. He does miracles, lying wonders. He's a fraud. He's deceiving. And he makes this statue in, in honor of the first beast and he tells everybody to worship it. And if you don't worship it, you're going to be executed. In fact, he's going to put on a mandate. Oh, you ever heard of that term before? He's going to mandate, not that you get a poke in the arm or have to wear a mask on your face, but that you have to have 666 inscribed on your forehead or in your hand. What is this mandate stuff all about? I thought we were free people. That we could make our own decisions. I tell you what I think it is. I don't think this is the mark of the beast at all. No, no, no. This is all about medicine. What's coming is going to be about worship. But it is the precursor to get a world population ready to accept the mandate of the end time Antichrist. Do this now in the name of science. Medicine. I'm going to force you to do what you don't want to do because some of you do want to do it. Listen, I, I've had the, the vaccination. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. But I am against forcing people to do what they do not believe they should do with a clear conscience before God themselves. Every individual needs to make their own choice. This end time villain, the Antichrist, is going to demand that you have his mark in your hand, on your forehead, or you cannot buy or sell. You see, the one today is you can't fly <laughs> or work if you don't have it. Precursor. It's just getting us ready. Getting us ready for the end time villain. End time villain. It says in chapter 19, I saw heaven open. And there before me was a white horse whose rider was called Faithful and True. And with justice, he judges and makes war. Hey, this is meek Jesus. I, I want to introduce you to meek Jesus. Meekness has nothing to do with being a sissy. Meekness has, is, is all about giving the correct response to a situation. And the situation here calls for justice, and he is going to make a righteous war with the Antichrist or these two beasts. And the beasts are going to be captured. And with him, the false prophet. So the first beast and the second beast, the one from the sea and the one from the land are going to be captured. And the two of them are going to be thrown alive into the lake of fire. A burning sulfur. Forever and ever. Forever and ever. You know, the Bible says that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. It was never prepared for us. But those who align themselves with Satan and the Antichrist, they align themselves with the place where they are going to go. Here's my final thoughts. God wants you to know that you have nothing to fear. This sounds all pretty scary, didn't it? Evil times, bad times. God says, listen, I don't want you to fear anything. For greater is the one who is in you than the one who is in the world. Amen. Amen. God is greater. Listen, my final thought. Jesus will remove his church before the Antichrist reign of terror. I know that from 2 Thessalonians 5.9, God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. In the previous chapter, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we which are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds in the air, and ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Then he goes on, he talks about the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord is a day of darkness. And he says, And that day hath not overtake us, because we are children of the light. And then he gives us this verse. I love this verse. He did not appoint us to suffer wrath. He's going to 
take us out of the world before the dreadful day of the Lord, before the rise of the Antichrist. And that's why I can say with confidence, none of those people I put up on the screen, including Trump and Biden, Obama, none of them are the Antichrist. Because he does not emerge until we are gone when we know Jesus. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Listen to this. In the revelation itself, it says to the church, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. God is keeping us out of that. He's coming first. It could happen right now. I notice in all the, the movies about the rapture that when they take off, there's a puddle of clothing left behind. I'm glad I'm going to get a white robe in heaven. <laughs> and a lot of you are glad too. <laughs> yeah. Boom, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, boom. That which is corruption puts on incorruption. That which is mortal, subject to dying, puts on immortality. Woo, it says, actually it says, we're clothed over. I, I put on this new thing, my white robe, I'm going to be clothed, and I'm going to be out of here. Out of here. Before this terrible time. But John wants us to know, even though we're not going to be here when this terrible villain arrives, the spirit and the people of the Antichrist are already here. And they want to deceive you. They want to trick you. They want to take you down. They want to shake your faith. They want to call evil good and good evil. So you have to take a stand. And if you take a stand, it may cost you something. Even your life. Hmm. Furthermore, I got this final thought. We win. I love this part. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Listen, this here and now is not it. It is just a, a little speck in time, but in all eternity... I'm going to be in a new heaven and new earth. I'm going to be with Jesus. And you are too if you know him as your Savior and made him your Lord. Here's the point. What you really need to do is you really need to know Jesus. If you haven't confessed him as your Lord and Savior, you must do that. And become a child of God. Have your sins forgiven. Be on your way to heaven. And you can do that right now. You know, as scary as the end time is, knowing Jesus takes the fear out of the end time horror. Amen? Happy Halloween. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so blessed that you have given us a plan of redemption in the Bible. How you save us from our sins. We no longer have the penalty of sin, the wages of death hanging over us. Lord, every day as we trust in you, you give us the strength and you save us from the power of sin in our lives. And the day is coming, Lord, when you're going to save us from the very presence of sin as you come and take us out of this world to be with you. Lord, so right now we're so very thankful that you've given us the Holy Spirit and that he is greater in us than anything in this world. May we be sensitive to his presence respond positively to his promptings as he wishes to guide us and lead us and teach us to assure us. Lord, we're thankful that we have your word and it's inspired. It's the word of God. It speaks to us. When no one else hears it, we Christians, we hear your voice. And we listen. It's profitable for instruction, for reproof, for correction that we as men and women may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works that you are blessed with. We thank you for this season, Lord, of Halloween. And we realize that with all the scariness and the horror movies, we're going to miss the biggest horror of all because Jesus is taking us to be with him 
before all hell breaks loose on earth. Thank you, O oh Lord, for saving us. Lord, if there's someone here right now who doesn't know Jesus, I pray they just say, Lord, save me. And you will. It's, your, it's their faith that you see. And their faith is counted for righteousness. Lord, I pray some right now is saying, Lord, save me. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.